So thanks everyone for having us. Uh, super excited to be here. We're going to be talking about reframing hybrid or moving beyond performance today. Um, this is our first time in Amsterdam. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, this is some my first us, time in Europe. Yeah, some of us a little too much fun, <laughs> uh, but awesome, awesome place. So. Also, thanks to Adobe for having us come out here. Yeah. This is awesome. So, so I'm Max, uh, one of the co-creators of Ionic. I'm a developer. Um, follow me on Twitter, at Max Lynch, if you're into that kind of thing. And I'm Ben. I'm a designer. Uh, I'm also one of the co-creators and, and founders of Ionic. You can follow me as well. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of Ionic. Um, just like show of hands, like how many people have heard of Ionic or used it? Okay, so <laughs> all right. Hey. So you know what it is. Like we'll skip the pleasantries. Uh, <laughs> basically, if you haven't heard of it, it's like a UI library for Cordova apps. Um, and definitely check it out, IonicFramework.com. Yeah. So um, we actually don't really want to talk about Ionic itself today, which I guess is a good thing because it seems like you guys already know what it is. Um, we actually want to talk about a subject that is near and dear to our hearts, uh, hybrid development. Um, so we all know that in hybrid development, the number one concern for all hybrid developers is performance. Performance, 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 performance. Performance. <laughs> uh, most of the discussion around hybrid apps uh, is about performance, uh, and in many cases, uh, lack thereof. Right, so I think most Cordova developers know uh, can, can remember the time where you like hack together this app with like fast click, you throw in Bootstrap, you try to make it look like iOS, you try to kind of like match like native styles with tabs and stuff, uh, maybe throw in a framework, hammer JS, like all these random libraries. And you kind of ended up with what we affectionately refer to as a Franken app. Uh, and, and, it, and for a long time, like the pinnacle of achievement for a hybrid developer was getting your button to click in less than 300 milliseconds. And like, it, was, it was a terrible time to build you know, hybrid apps. Like, we really wanted this technology to work, but it was just kind of like, it wasn't quite there for us. So uh, you know, we kind of looked over at all the native developers, and we envied them because they could just focus on the problem that they were trying to solve for like, their company or whatever, instead of trying to re-implement like, a UI library every single app they built. Uh, and, and they kind of like, looked back at us with a bit of contempt and scorn for like, you know, making them kind of look bad by association. So we were hacking all this stuff together. It, just was, it, was a, it was a tough time to build hybrid apps. Those were dark days. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, like, our goal with Ionic was to kill off the Franken app uh, and let all the hybrid developers focus on solving real problems for their company problems that mattered, problems that were like unique to you. So that's what we, we built. Yeah, so we built Ionic because we thought the phones had gotten fast enough for web development, but that the standards for building fast mobile apps hadn't really entered the, the tool belt of the common web developer. So essentially there was really no like web SDK. Like that's what we kind of have been saying. Um, and back then it was kind of like the wild west for developers. Um, and we wanted to give developers, web developers, a toolkit that just had performance baked right into it. Um, and best practices, you know, things like animations, gestures, uh, a mobile-focused UI that was like focused on native. Not, we're not building web apps here, um, although you could. Um, so the mobile web developers could use the tech that they already knew uh, to put it towards making apps and putting them in the app stores. Right. And so it's been over a year since we released the first version of Ionic. We actually released the 1.0 like a week or so ago, so it's stable. It should be stable, so <laughs> this is a good day. <laughs> uh, so we're celebrating here a little bit. And uh, basically, we noticed like, over the last year that the conversation has started to change. Instead of people wondering, like, how do I, make my, you know, how do I get rid of the tap click delay? How do I like, make my animation not flicker? Or you know, how do I stop layout thrashing? Like, all these like, things. The, the conversation started shifting into like, how do I add video to my app or add audio? And like, how do I do these practical things that like are unique to my app? And, and that's awesome, but I think we're still kind of stuck on just talking about performance all the time. 
and we read blog posts that tell us that HTML5 sucks, or it's not ready, or it's too slow. And, and we get asked all the, all, like, time and time again, like, how are we improving performance? How can we make performance better? And, you know, performance is really, really important. It's, it's something that we've spent, like, almost every single day at Ionic, building Ionic, we're focused on performance. And it's one of those things that, like, uh, we can do. Like, we spend the time on it, so hopefully other people don't have to. So yes, performance is hugely important. Like, of course, if we don't ever make hybrid apps fast enough, no one will want to use them, no one will want to develop them. It'll kind of go away. You know, of course, we care about performance, of course. Of course, of course. But maybe we're all being fooled a little bit into, by this native dialogue that's kind of making us focus on this performance thing all the time. You know, maybe hybrid development is actually threatening to a lot of people. And so we're kind of forced into kind of being focused on this one thing that we don't do quite as well as native developers do. Even though we have all these other things that we're so good at with hybrid apps, in fact, better than the native developers have. And, and we think we should start talking about those things, all those superpowers that we have that we're not really taking advantage of yet because we don't really know about them because we're kind of just focused on performance. Right, so uh, we want to talk about those today. Um, so we've drilled it down into a few topics. Um, and the first one is cost. Uh, this isn't like, this is, this is very obvious, this is kind of a no-brainer. One of the biggest reasons why people build hybrid apps is just because it's, it's affordable, it's cheap to do. Um, it's just way less expensive than building a native app. There's really no argument there. But why are native apps so expensive? Well, first you need to find someone with a background in native development. Uh, I hope I don't offend any native developers here. Um, and then you need to hope that maybe they've built an iPhone app before. Uh, which is awesome if they did. Then you also need to hope that this person knows all the other native languages that are required to have an app in each platform. Because if not, you need to find two or three more of these people that do. Um, and they're not cheap. Uh, it turns out that knowing a specific tech stack that only runs on a few platforms is actually really lucrative and quite rare. Uh, it's really valuable. Um, you know, just look at job postings for COBOL. Um, but let's say you do find all these people. Well, then you need to convince one or all of them to work at your company. And it turns out that a lot of these hacker mobile types don't want to work at your big company. Um, they want that pre-IPO stock at the next hot Silicon Valley startup. Um, so building native apps is just incredibly expensive. And finding native devs is hard. Um, convincing them to work for you is difficult. So it's actually a really tough process for most companies. Um, and that's what we've seen. But the web stack, on the other hand, is one of the most widely used and understood application runtimes. HTML5 is the most popular job skill on sites like Indeed. So chances are you're going to be able to find someone to work on your hybrid app without breaking the bank. And a lot of these companies already employ web developers in-house. So it's just like, it's much more efficient for them to enable these web developers to just become mobile developers by building hybrid apps. Um, not to mention that you can build uh, one app on all the different platforms using just one code base. And we all know this stuff, but it matters. It really, really matters. And so uh, one of the things that we're seeing at Ionic is that with stuff like the Internet of Things, uh, where you have this proliferation of devices and sensors that need to connect to apps and power them and interact with them, the amount of apps that are being created right now is just skyrocketing. Um, and we're also seeing big companies build internal apps in what we call the shadow app store, um, where users build and install apps from an in internal company database instead of going through the like, traditional uh, app store route like Apple's, you know, uh, Apple Store, the Google Play Store. Um, these companies want to build data-driven apps that are fast and performant on all the different devices that all of their employees have and bring into work every single day. And they want to build a lot of them. Um, so the cost of building each one has to go down, or else it's just like not sustainable. So the point is that um, hybrid just kicks ass when it comes to return on investment. Um, and this really matters, and it's only going to continue to matter as time goes on. Right, and just to add to that, I think like cost actually came to kind of bite us in the back back in the day because uh, a lot of people would find out that building a hybrid app was actually more expensive because like like I said before, like we were constantly building these like core like components over and over and over again and reinventing the wheel. Like you had to build 
and not like a UI SDK first and then your app. And so for a lot of people, like hybrid was actually more expensive and harder to, to actually do right. So hopefully with things like Ionic, Kendo, all these other frameworks, you can just focus on that thing that matters and the cost actually, the cost benefits actually become a lot more realistic. True that. So the next up is agility, basically the speed of, of development, uh, which is really, really huge for hybrid development. So there's this awesome XKCD comic where you know, the number one reason for programmers to slack off uh, a long time ago was their code was compiling. And they had to wait for the code to compile before they could go and even test it and debug it. Very, very slow process. And I think it's fair to say that the modern version of that is waiting for Apple to review and then reject your app over and over and over. So like, it's, it's a really, really painful process. And like, to be honest, like, it sucks. It's terrible. I love mobile development, and the worst part of building mobile apps is the freaking app store. You know, like, it's just a disaster. And I think a lot of people uh, just kind of assume like, that's just the reality. That's just how it's going to be. And I, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true either. No. So Apple actually recently slipped some magical little language into their terms of service. Basically, you can't uh, download or, or execute you know, external code uh, unless it's been, you know, it has to be packaged up as is for the App Store. It's signed, you can't modify it. We're used to all that stuff. Except Apple added a clause where if you're actually running in a web view, you can update the app as long as you don't change the purpose of the app. So basically don't build, you know, a little kid's game and then turn it into an adult game. Uh, <laughs> basically, like, if you do that and you, and you stay within that, those rules, you can update web view content from anywhere. And because we're super smart people, we built a hybrid app, and so we can update it from anywhere as many times as we want. So I think this is really, really cool, and I know like it's kind of becoming a thing, but I still feel like most people are not even anywhere near using a feature like this. So there's some really cool things you can do when you have this live update ability. So if you made a small grammatical error, you can quickly fix it, say you use the wrong version of your, 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 and your, it yeah. happens, yeah. So you, you need to fix your grammar mistake because you're too embarrassed and you have to wait two weeks uh, for it to update. You don't have to do that with a hybrid app. You could just fix it and deploy the change immediately. So fixing small errors is one thing. You can actually perform major surgery on your app remotely. And this is something that, that, that's really, really exciting to me. Um, because you can't really do this if, if, if you built a native app. Like your UI is in the binary, you can't modify it. Um, you're not really fetching remote resources. There's no like easy like dynamic loading of UI. Uh, so no, like very few apps are doing that at all. Um, but when you don't have this restri restriction, you can do some really, really cool things. Like let's say add a new tab dynamically, change the branding for your app, change the colors, like tweak the UI. Um, you can do all this in a hybrid app. You can also do things uh, like run a dynamic A-B test, you know, push a new A-B test to the end user. Uh, for example, let's say that your boss really, really wants to see if putting more puppies into the app increases conversion rates, which I, I think is pretty logical. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So you can actually just push a new update, replace the logo with a puppy, and, uh, you know, watch your conversion rate skyrocket. Uh, yeah. we've, we've, we've used this tactic before. Uh, it works really well, actually. Yeah, so. we've had great success with this. So try it out. More puppies. Um, so we're actually building a service for this right now called Ionic Deploy. Um, basically, you just push new code update, and the client will detect that there's a new update, download it, cache it locally, so it's not like you know fetching everything from the server and over and over and over. And you can like roll back and push new versions. That's coming out soon. We're calling it Ionic Deploy. PhoneGap has hydration, which has done this for a lot longer than we have, which is cool. Definitely check it out. Um, you can also roll your own. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, you might even just want to put like a little embedded, just update a small part of your app or, or update the full app. It really depends what you need, but you can do a lot of different approaches. Um, so yeah, so I think this is really awesome because you know when all of our native friends are sitting there waiting for their app to get approved, uh, you can perform major rocket surgery on your app remotely and in real time. Yeah. And I think like, this is something that we're all just kind of waking up to. We don't have it in our, in our development workflow yet. Uh, and we really should be because 
like, it's an advantage that we have that other people don't have, and we need to play to our strengths. Yep, so um, next topic we want to talk about is tooling. Um, there are just so many tools available to you as a hybrid developer, and I feel like, we feel like a lot of times we just don't talk about it enough. Uh, we don't show off how many there are. There's almost too many tools. Uh, there's a lot, so we're not going to cover every single one today, um, but we, we handpicked the ones that we thought were most applicable um, and allow you to do some awesome stuff. Um, so since you're building a hybrid app, we all know that you're actually pretty much just working with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, and because of that, you have tons of awesome web development tools that have been battle tested for decades uh, on your side. Um, and this is a huge advantage. Um, in native land, you're, you're forced to step through a clunky debugger often, um, which makes it difficult to modify user interfaces and especially do it while the app is running. But as a hybrid developer, you get the full benefit and agility of the browser debugger from browsers that we already all know and love, uh, like Chrome and Safari, maybe some others. Um, but you can debug your mobile app right there on the device, and this is awesome. Um, so one of the greatest tools that comes with this power, with great power comes great responsibility, you can use this thing called, we call Live Reload. Um, so we're seeing Ionic developers use this all the time to develop right on their devices, on multiple platforms, all at the same time. Um, and this is a huge deal. It makes it so much more enjoyable to develop an app when you can actually make a change on your computer, change the color of something, update the content, and see it update on your phones that are plugged in, all, every single different kind, uh, in real time. And it's an advantage that we have as hybrid developers. Uh, and then there's tools like the Ionic Playground, which is, and there's lots of tools like this, uh, but this is one that we built and we just put out a couple weeks ago. Um, where it actually lets you build, test, and code all in the browser. Um, and the benefit here is that you don't have to install anything. There's no dependencies you need to download. You don't need to change any settings on your computer. Um, you're just pure coding in the browser with all the tools that come with it. And I think this is really important to note, um, that tools like these are going to dramatically lower the barrier to entry for mobile development. Um, and it's going to help train the next generation of mobile developers. Um, so we're seeing classes all over the place teach kids uh, with tools like these on the web how to build a mobile app. Um, that's so cool, and it's something that we're just starting to notice happen all over the place, and we're really excited about it. The point being is that tools like these elevate the accessibility, um, and that's just a really important thing to mention. Yeah, like if you're a web developer and you're not like a super strong, like, you know, hacker type and you don't want to install everything, like you can get up and running and start building hybrid apps immediately because we're just in the browser. Everyone has a browser. I think that's like so, so cool and we don't really like take full advantage of it. Um, but when you do, you realize you can actually get really, really far. And with these services like Ripple, uh, tools like Ripple that let you mock like the native APIs, like you can defer going to the device for a lot longer and you can build your app way more quickly. So I think this is going to be huge. It's going to tr train way more web developers. It's going to make it so more people can work on your app. So like finding and hiring people is just going to be easier. Uh, so we're super excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, so on top of that, you can also preview and interact with your apps um, as you build them live on the device as though they were in the App Store, but they aren't. Um, and this is really, really cool. Um, so we have a tool called Ionic View that lets you do this. Um, you can preview your apps in the phone as though they were native. Uh, the PhoneGap developer app, it lets you do this. Um, you can share your apps with clients or other developers on the project for a quicker uh, feedback loop and development process, and it just makes things so much more enjoyable. Um, the actual stakeholders and clients can experience the app in what it'll actually feel like and look like, um, but you don't have to go through the whole process of putting it in the App Store to get that experience out of it, and you can still access all these native features. Um, and again, this is, this is stuff that just comes right out of the box for us as hybrid developers, uh, and we should be talking about it more because it's a really big deal. So you can also take an IDE like Visual Studio um, that comes with support for building hybrid apps right out of the box, and tools like these kind of help streamline the uh, process of installing all the things that you do need to get up and running on your computer in order to put these apps in the App Store. Um, and what's cool about Visual Studio that we're excited about is it has Ionic templates, uh, starter templates, just ready to go, and we'll continue to have more in there. Um, so if you're a Windows developer, definitely, definitely check out Visual Studio for that. Um, but tools like these, and there are a ton of them, they just help ease that pain of installing those dependencies, and they, like, it just makes it more enjoyable to code. Um, so with all these tools, you might be 
uh, noticing a trend, uh, and that trend is that there is no waiting or stepping through difficult hoops. Um, as a hybrid developer, a lot of these tools are just available to you for free, like 95% of them. You can get up and running in minutes. Um, and it, it's something that we should, we should talk about. We have great tools, we have a great community, uh, and lots of support because we have the web on our side. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> tools, like hopefully you won't catch on fire and whatever, but uh, <laughs> tools are uh, really, really important. And I think uh, uh, one of the other big benefits that we talk a lot about up here, and it sounds super obvious, is like one code base for multiple platforms. Um, and usually when, we're, when we talk about that, we're talking about, you know, mobile platforms. I can build my Cordova app for, uh, you know, iOS, I can build one for Android, I can build one for Windows Phone. And like, that's cool, but that's just mobile, you know? What if we could actually have one single code base for everything that we're deploying to, every device that we're interacting with? Our mobile app can work on the desktop, it can work, you know, it can have an output to the watch kit uh, to the Apple Watch. Uh, it can interact with a headless device that's just get, gathering sensor data. Um, JavaScript has kind of become ubiquitous. The browser runtime, similarly ubiquitous on a lot of platforms. We have not really embraced this at all. Like, we're still kind of separating our code into multiple platforms. Uh, and I think as hybrid developers, we have embraced write once, run anywhere for mobile. Um, but we think you could do that for everything. And, and I'm not really talking about responsive design here. Responsive design is really, really great, but it's meant for content sites to just look better on smaller screens. It's not going to provide a different like, app experience on, on the mobile phone and like, a desktop experience on desktop. That's not what it's for. Uh, and that's like, a pretty big difference. Um, you know, we've, we, when we hear about write once, run anywhere, I think we kind of think it's like you know, a dream that maybe a pipe once had, and we don't really think that it's like, a real thing. Um, but, but one thing that we've, we found from building Ionic is we started to get asked a lot uh, from people that were like using Angular for like a web app, for example, and they wanted the same code to work on mobile without having to do anything. And for a while I was kind of like, no, nah, like that, I'm not even going to deal with that. That's, that's just focusing on mobile. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more it made perfect sense. Like they have, uh, they have this like stack and it does run in everything. But it's not designed to actually look good on everything or actually embrace all the features for different devices. So they're still fragmenting out all their stuff. And, you know, this has been done before or tried to be done before, like Java, for example. Um, you, you could write once, run anywhere, kind of. You'd have like multiple desktop platforms and they'd kind of clone the UI or build their own. And it was fine for like desktop apps, like crazy things you'd see at the dentist. I mean, this actually looks pretty cool. but. Uh, I like teeth, so um, <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically, it's kind of weird to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, basically, like you can, you really can have one single app, and we have been experimenting with this at Ionic because we think it's one of the strengths of the web that only we have that advantage. Like you can't run native code, obviously on your desktop uh, for like your website. But you can run a lot of the same code that we're writing in a Cordova app for your desktop app. And as we start to shift from these content sites to like a desktop app experience, it's a lot easier to make the shift and just adjust the feature set. For example, like instead of taking a, a photo from the camera, just let them upload a photo, you know? We're all using the same API endpoints. Uh, like single page apps have, are becoming ubiquitous. And so there's just, it doesn't, there's not a, a, as big of a technological difference between platforms anymore. So we are calling this contextual design. And uh, right now, this is just kind of like an aspirational thing where we don't have a lot of concrete stuff to show. But with Ionic 2, the next version that we're, we're building with Angular 2, we are going to make, hopefully, multiple platforms like a first-class citizen where you can actually build one app. It'll work on everything. And it'll have like hooks for you know, making sure that the native experience is different. Uh, but you'll have a different, like, app experience on each one. Um, so we're really excited about this. I think it's new territory. I think, again, it's a strength that we have that no one else really has, and we should take advantage of it, and we're super, super excited about it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, when it comes to the dialogue around hybrid apps, um, it's really time to start rethinking the value of constantly focusing on just performance. Um, and to start talking about and sharing with each other 
all of these other advantages that we all have as hybrid developers. Um, and it's kind of, it's up to us to realize uh, the full potential of the browser runtime uh, and the magnitude, the multitude of devices that support it. Um, instead of getting stuck on this performance dialogue with these performance issues that, quite frankly, are quickly fading away. Um, so when we use ready-made mobile solutions like Ionic and other frameworks, we get performance baked in, um, which frees us to focus on problems that are so much more interesting and so much more valuable for us to be spending our time on. Um, and when we focus on those problems, we start to develop apps that not only pass as native, but get featured as best-in-class apps in the app stores. Like Swerk It. Swerk It, yes. Um, Where's Ryan? Ryan's here. <laughs> so we, we start to get to market faster for less. We start to build quicker, test designs immediately without resubmitting them. Um, we have awesome tools to use. Um, so many more at our disposal to get here, to get there. Um, and essentially, uh, we believe that with hybrid, you know, we actually become more successful using web technologies. And in many ways, the hybrid app platform is an improvement over native. It's not the step backwards that so many would have us believe. Um, and it's time to start owning that conversation around hybrid and start building better apps. So thank you all for having us. Uh, we're happy to be here. And yeah. Excellent. We've got some time for questions. If you sit down there, and I'm going to hover menacingly behind you. Uh, Niels, if you want to set up in the between, that would be lovely. So uh, we have one question from the audience. When is Windows Phone support coming? <laughs> As uh. in, get your shit together. <laughs> It, it, people are using it. It kind of works better. Um, well, well, 1.0, we have a lot more support for, for, uh, yeah, for Windows Yeah, just font. in the last release. But we are probably going to be focusing on it in a few months. We'll have something that actually works a lot better. I've so. got a colleague here in the audience as well. Billy, if you put your hand up, if anybody has a question about that stuff, he can help you. It's over there. Uh, Finnish person, so don't expect fast answers. Just <laughs> very thought through ones. <laughs> This is how Finnish people work. I worked with Nokia for a while. It was amazing. <laughs> it's in the phone for like three minutes. Like, oh, no. OK. So um, yeah, I'm very impressed. Very nice presentation. Very Thank slick you. put together. Um, what are the main uh, prejudices that you have to deal with all the time? And what do you think is, uh, is the driving force behind them? Like, um, when people say, like, oh, we heard that before, like, I mean, when yeah. the Java example is a good example, because I love the idea of, like, build once, run everywhere, but this is almost a dirty sentence for a lot of people <laughs> by now. Right. I think, like, the prejudice against the DOM is, is very, very prevalent, and I think some of it is warranted. Like, it's definitely, it needs to be improved for certain use cases. But I think, in general, like, a lot of it had to do with the tools we were using, you know? Like jQuery, which is it's a great framework, uh, but wasn't built for kind of optimizing, like, you know, your, your DOM updates. So the so layouts wouldn't thrash and you wouldn't flicker. Um, so when, you, when you're a little bit more, like, careful about that, you actually can get a lot of performance. And when you animate, animate, like, transform, scale, you know, opacity, uh, that stuff's all really, really fast. And oftentimes you can use those techniques even where they don't seem super obvious. Um, and that really, really helps. And I think we've closed the gap like a lot more than we had like a year and a half ago even. Um, like the reason we built Ionic was we, we had an iPhone 5 and wanted to try to build like a side menu that you could drag and like make it feel fast. And we built a little demo and like we were kind of blown away that you could actually do it if you just like did transforms and felt like as web developers we hadn't really gotten that kind of skill set embedded in our, in our toolkit yet. Um, so once you do, you can actually do like a lot of amazing things. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to be this endless race. Every time we get something new in HTML5 across browsers, people, first of all, don't believe it and just see like five-year-old articles and say like, oh, browsers didn't upgrade <laughs> since then. Some, sadly enough, didn't. But uh, it's more or less, okay, but native now has this thing. Why hasn't the web caught up yet? Do you also feel that not every app needs all the new features that are coming out, that there's fashionable features that for half a year everybody has to use and then they're gone again? <laughs> um, I would say, like, uh, <laughs> as developers, we're constantly, like, pushing ex excessive animations. And if, you've, if you play with the most popular apps, like, they're not excessively animated. Right. You know, they have a few, like, swiping effects, and that's, you know, like I said, just do that with transforms. It's, that's very easy to do. 
Uh, but I think having these like really crazy complicated like 3D like apps that are like just like a data driven app, like you just don't see that. And I think people expect you know our apps to behave that way, and it's just like they don't need to. Like we can simplify our designs a lot more. Um, so I'd say that's kind of like. Definitely yeah, it builds things. a better user experience that way as well. Like, like Max said, you don't see these, the most popular apps don't have any crazy transforming 3D cubes and crazy things happening on them. They're simple because they need to work for tons of different people and be easy to use and, and be understandable quickly. So. Yeah, and also like idioms like, oh yeah, everybody needs to have an endless scroller. Like uh, uh, everybody needs to have a, a, a drag to release and drag to refresh. And I mean, when we did pointer events, that was the big thing. You can't do a drag to refresh, so that obviously is a standard nobody will ever be able to use. So uh, do you think that every new operating system coming out, new version, will come up with new idioms like that? Or am I too conspiracy theory about this? Uh, I think they definitely will. Like, if you look at material design on Android, there's a lot of different, like, gesture-driven uh, UIs. Um, I don't think they're necessarily all super intuitive. And we're still learning how to like design around that like world. So I think we'll continue to see that. Um, and I think as we kind of get used to what we have, there will always be the like desire to change it for the next version. Yeah, uh, you talked about online editing and also in editing on the device. Um, to a degree, that's okay, but of course, some devices are just too small to edit on. Um, what do you think about the what you do in open device labs and stuff that you do like connecting with web uh, uh, with 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 like web RTC or whatever to devices and just test fifty devices at the same time? It's do do you think people should concentrate on a few devices that they actually will have most of their users on, or do you think you should try to cover as much as ground as you can? Um, I would definitely say cover the 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 main ones first. And then go and test like the smaller ones. I've, I've yeah, that was our like when we were building Ionic. That was kind of our our game plan was making sure it worked on the big ones and make sure it worked on the ones that most people are using. And then went back and added support for other ones. And we actually probably upset a few people, but we dropped support for a lot of older platforms because there are other frameworks that their main like vision uh, and like core philosophy is to work on every single phone ever existed. And that's not necessarily like our philosophy. Um, like jQuery Mobile is a perfect example. Yeah, and I think like uh, developers think that certain platforms are more prevalent than they are, and we get asked a lot to support things that no one's using, and it's like it's really hard for us to validate it because it's a lot of work. And you know, like Android 2.3 was a perfect example. Like when we released Ionic, uh, everyone was kind of complaining about 2.3, and the the percentage usage dramatically dropped off in a few months after that. And so, like, I'm glad that we didn't invest too much time into it. I think that was the right choice. So we just have to balance, like, the moving, like, market and, you know, spend our time on the most popular platforms that we can because we're a small team. We have limited resources. You talked about the problem of app markets and, and, and like, basically saying, eh, no, you're not going to update, sorry, because we don't like reasons. And, uh, uh, but what I found interesting is that, like, we keep getting from native platforms, we keep getting the promise of atomic updates of applications. And with a hybrid app, you can easily do that. You can keep your frame around it, and you're just like, OK, you need a new level for a game. Let's load only the level data rather than downloading the whole 20 meg again. Do you think native apps will catch on with this? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Android has promised it two Google I.O.s ago. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, like you said, it it's really depends on your application. Like, some just need a data source, like a, like a, a JSON file they're going to load new level with. Um, but some actually need to update the whole UI. And I think there is no, kind of like what I mentioned before, like there's no like service or framework right now for like core native apps to actually modify the UI or like load different ones. Uh, we're not using tools like that natively. Uh, but on the web, that's like what we've been doing forever. So it's kind of weird to come up here and brag about something that honestly we've been doing forever. Uh, kind of, it's, it's annoying, it's like a step backwards to some extent. But uh, that's what is like. That's the way it is uh, for native development. So um, I don't know. I think it's a lot easier for us to do it. I think they have a lot more challenges to overcome uh, than we do. So we'll see. I hope. I hope they do. I love the <laughs> functions that we have. I remember when everything needed a gradient, uh, a drop shadow, and a bevel, <laughs> and then we made all of these into uh, CSS standards. And then flat design came out, and we didn't need any of them anymore. <laughs> it's just like really, guys. Like. <laughs> 
Um, so when you when you say like uh, uh, which 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 would you say would, would be your best competitor? Like uh, if you said like if you don't use Ionic, who would you say would be another per good framework to use that does almost the same things? Um, I mean, Onsen's awesome. Uh, Kendo, Sencha, those are all great frameworks. Can't go wrong. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Cool.